welcome everyone. Welcome. It's uh, good to have everyone gathered this evening. And uh, I have a thought for you. Can I give you a thought? Um, we've been doing oh, evaluation meetings at CLBI and then Ted and I had two days of, of uh, brainstorming. We're the only ones in the main classroom at CLBI. We had our, our two tables. Oh, my dog. Two tables, a big whiteboard, and, uh, and reflecting on uh, where God is, is leading us. And uh, last week as we were, as I was preparing and stewing over all of these beautiful thoughts that God has been giving me, uh, the parable of the sower has came, came to mind. And that's a parable. It's also called the parable of the soils. And um, I ask you tonight, uh, you know, what kind of soil uh, do you find yourself in? Do you find yourself with some uh, bit of a rocky soil uh, where, the, where the, the seed grows up quickly and then the sun comes out and scorches it? Or is your, your life pretty beaten down? You've been on the path and birds are coming and just picking away the, the seed that's been planted. Um, or is it thorny? Uh, it's going, you know, the, the seed gets planted and it's just trying to grow and that just gets choked out in your life. Or do you find yourself in a season where, you know what, the soil is actually pretty, pretty good right now and it's starting to grow and taking root and, and keep going. I, I want you all to know that you were designed to, to produce great fruit. You were designed to have a life that um, will produce love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That is God's design for us. Now, we live in a very thorny world. Uh, we live in a, in a world that's got things that pound us down sometimes. Uh, but oh, I know that is God's plan for us. Not that our lives are perfect, not that our lives are pain-free. No, not at all. But that's the trajectory that Jesus wants to have us on, especially when he invites us to be part of his kingdom. So I want you to think about those words, uh, that, especially that parable, the sower. And tonight uh, in the teaching, Mackenzie Wall is going to be doing teaching tonight. And the teaching that he's going to be doing tonight is going to do some soil enrichment. Um, there's probably some gardeners in the group. Wave if you're a gardener. I was a gardener. Now I just grow raspberries. I, anyway, we have a lot of deer that just eat every, eats everything in our backyard. And I don't like weeding, which I already said. Um, but uh, what Mackenzie's going to be teaching is a core concept that helps to break up hardened soil, uh, that helps to uh, pull out rocks, and develop you know good nutrients uh, it helps to get rid of thorny lies and wherever you find yourself tonight it can move into becoming good good soil so i'm going to pray and then i'm going to give it over to mackenzie okay lord jesus thank you for tonight thank you uh, for springtime and thank you lord that you are desiring to produce great fruit and Jesus, as we meet tonight, we pray that you will use this uh, to do enriching work in the soil of our lives. So come and speak your words of truth in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll give it over to Mackenzie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Wall. I just finished my third year of CLBI doing an internship at Resurrection Church in Camrose, Alberta as the youth intern. And also a uh, quarter of my internship was with Spoken Word Ministries in Saskatoon. Um, yeah, and I'm, I live in Camrose currently, and my favorite vegetable is probably spinach. Um, yeah, I'm just going to tell a little story to get you guys uh, kind of more familiar with myself. I've been having a little bit of trouble in my prayer life recently uh, because, you know, I'm praying and I'm sitting there and I'm going, dear Jesus, uh, and I, usually that's how I start all my prayers because, you know, scripture says, pray in Jesus' name. And the more I say, dear Jesus, well, I start picturing dear Jesus, and uh, that really just throws me off. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll be teaching about law and gospel. I was going to try, and last week I was just super pumped. I finished a book called The Hammer of God, which is super awesome, and I highly recommend it. And I'm going to 
be bouncing off it for a lot of my teaching points. But um, I'm super pumped about the gospel, especially because oh, it's just so fruitful and amazing. Um, but then as I was thinking of teaching about gospel, I realized you can't really teach about gospel without also teaching about the doctrine of law. So this is just pretty much going to turn into a confirmation class on law and gospel, but it's going to be awesome. Um, so yeah, um, one of the things, now all of doctrines, the first and the foremost is the doctrine of justification. However, immediately following upon it, and almost equally as important, is the doctrine of how to distinguish between law and gospel. When we compare Holy Scripture with other writings, we notice that no book seems to be as full of contradictions as the Bible. And this seems to be true not only in minor points, but also even in its main points, namely regarding the doctrine of how we may come to God and be saved. Um, so some things to understand about law and gospel are both of them are from God and both of them are equally necessary for us humans. Um, so you might be asking yourself, what is law and what is gospel? Now, some people would say the law is just the Old Testament, everything given in that, and the New Testament is the gospel, but that is just not accurate because if you've read the book of James, you'll see a lot of law. And uh, if you look at the Old Testament, there's lots of stories of God showing his undeserved grace and favor towards us. And that's pretty much what the gospel is. It's The gospel literally means good news. Um, and that good news is God sent his son to die for us so that our sins may be forgiven. Uh, now, so to really distinguish between the two, law is anything that is a commandment from God. Um, sometimes the law comes with a promise attached to, to it. Uh, if you do this, your reward will be this. But this is always more disheartening because the greater the reward, the higher the request that we are given. Whereas gospel is just promises. Uh, another distinguish between the two, law is you must do this. Gospel is this is what Christ has done for you. Um, and both are important in all aspects of our life, especially if we're thinking about preaching, uh, because without the law, we cannot understand the gospel. And without the gospel, the law is of no benefit to us. Uh, I believe it's in Romans where it says the end of the law is death. Um, you can't actually get to salvation without um, the gospel. It, you'll just keep trying to work on your own, so on and so forth. Um, one of the, uh, I watched some great Lutheran uh, discussions on these topics, and one thing the guy said, every religion is based on the law. You know, you do this and you can make your way to heaven. Christianity being the only exception where it says, that no, God did it for you to get you into heaven so that you can be saved. Um, another one, I was listening to a great evangelist who was talking on the subject, and he was talking with a Muslim and a Buddhist, and the discussion kind of went down the way of the other two guys saying, you know, we all pretty much believe the same thing. And uh, as they were saying this, the evangelist says, well, if I'm hearing you right, what you guys are saying is, God's at the top of a mountain and we're all just trying to find our own way up there. And they agree. And he says, well, you know, my understanding is a little different. Um, the Christian view is that God comes down the mountain to us and he brings us to the top of the mountain. And that that's the good news of the gospel right there. Um, now a common one uh, through that book, it was uh, the hammer of God. It was really helpful. It goes through three different stories, all following the same uh, congregation in three different generations. And the first pastor to show up there, he's not even a Christian when he shows up. Uh, he went to college as an atheist and heard some Christians talking about theology and such. And uh, for the first time in his life, it seemed that this was not something that a bunch of um, 
imbeciles were talking about, but actually intelligent people having discussions about. And through that, he actually changed from going towards being a doctor to being a pastor. So he gets his doctorate and uh, he has the option to just go and have his own parish, but he wants to, he has this romantic idea of going to the small church and having the experience working his way up to being a pastor. Good thing he did because in the first church he's at, he gets sent on a house call and the guy who he's going to visit on his deathbed is just burdened under the law. He sees, he's, he's very familiar with the Bible uh, and he just sees himself in front of God, this judge, and he knows that he's going to be judged for his sin. The wages of sin is death and God is going to punish uh, sinners. And he can't find any comfort in that. And he's been in this state for years now, but now he's on his deathbed. And so Savonius, the first pastor, he tries to comfort him and he says, well, you know, you'll be fine. And the guy's eyes kind of light up when he says this. And he's like, really, pastor, how do you know I'll be fine? And he's, Savonius says, you know, you're the best guy I know. That's how I know you're going to be fine. And then the guy's eyes darken again and, he says, God's not going to judge me based on how I am compared to other men. He's going to judge me uh, compared to his law. And then Savonius just kind of has an, uh-oh, he's right moment. And he's just sitting there fumbling over his words. He can't find the right thing to comfort him. Uh, all that he can say can only bring worldly comfort, but not comfort to go and see the judge of the universe. So Savonius does what uh, any of us would do in that situation. And he goes outside and throws up. Uh, giving up all hope <laughs> but luckily a woman comes walking by and she's uh, she was coming because she heard this man was on his deathbed and he's still alive so she goes in to, ta to preach the gospel to this man and Savonius follows her and just kind of sits back from a distance defeated and she starts preaching about how it's not what this man does that gets him right with God, but it's what Jesus does, the imputed righteousness of God, that Jesus took on all of our punishment on the cross. Even though we are sinners and we're deservant of that punishment, it was Jesus who takes it. I saw, I heard a great, um, a great visual representation of this. It's like a picture of if you walked over to Jesus and he's got his crown of thorns on his head, and you place your hands on his head, and then you feel all the sin leaving your body onto this innocent lamb, the spotless lamb, and you want to pull your hands away, but he stops you and he says, no, let it happen. And he, he takes all this sin and he in his own body and he takes it up on the cross. And that's exactly what Jesus did so that when we are in front of the judge of the universe, as we've been baptized uh, in the Holy Spirit, um, in the baptism that Jesus gave us, uh, we die to ourselves as Jesus died on the cross, and we are raised to new life with Jesus when we come out of that water. And that's, that's exactly what it is. We have the new life as Jesus did. That's how we know there's going to be a resurrection. Um, and when we come out of that water, we're covered in Jesus' righteousness. Um, when we reserve, receive the word of God, receive this free gift. Uh, Lutheran doctrine points to we can't do anything to earn it. And I just lost the train of thought I was going to go down with that. So I'm going to go on to my next point. <laughs> um, another uh, few things about the law and the gospel. The law is what we are to do and the gospel is what God does. The law and gospel both promise salvation. The difference is the law always has conditions. So the greater the promise of the law, the more disheartening they are. Uh, and We can't actually obtain that because of original sin from Adam and Eve. Uh, the gospel does not have uh, conditions, but rather it has invitations. Um, and then when we preach the law, the reason we preach it is so that those who hear it will recognize their sin. That's why it is a poison to water down the law because you're not actually helping anyone in that situation. Their heart needs to come to that point where they are sorrowful. It is, um, 
you know, blessed is those who are poor in spirit, not those who are rich in spirit. Uh, but when we are concentrated on the law, um, the law has the opposite effect of its purpose, it entices the hearer to sin. Um, in the first section of the hammer of God, Savonius, after hearing the gospel from this lady, he, this is where he becomes a Christian, but he's now young in his faith. And now he's trying to do this performance thing for God. Like, okay, yeah, I've actually received faith once I have, um, once I've gotten all the sin out of my life. And that's, what he's convinced, but the more and more he tries this, the more he realizes that he himself is a sinner and he can't make it. And he's just getting destroyed by this. And he has another friend uh, from Paris, not too far away, who's also a pastor. And when at the end of his story, he opens up to this pastor that he tries so hard because that's what all of his messages are. They're all law-based. He tries so hard to follow that himself but he's always burdened under law and he can't escape it. And the pastor looks at him and says, I was experiencing the exact same thing. But this pastor, he won't stop smiling. Like ever since he got out of the carriage, he, he's just been smiling. He gave everybody a big bear hug. Uh, he's so happy. And he says this so nonchalantly, so filled with joy. And Savonius is just confused how can you possibly be smiling if you're under the same burden I am? But then he also starts explaining how the gospel was explained to him. Um, this is the great redemption you understand, um, that God has drawn across over all the sinfulness of the world, both with, out and within us. You believe that Christ died only for the sins you committed before you became spiritually concerned. He would hardly have needed to die for them. You could pr put them away by your own strength. But the corruption of sin is something that you cannot put away yourself. For this, you need a redeemer, one who suffers in your place. For otherwise, you might as well give up every thought of heaven right now. And that's where the book takes an amazing shift where it starts pointing towards Jesus only. Like You can't do it yourself. It's only through Jesus. And in the next one, uh, where the next pastor comes up, he also, he's more of a, he's starting a revival at the church. And it's already got a pastor uh, who knows the gospel. And it's really funny because he starts going on that uh, craze of, you have to uh, accept Jesus into your heart, that idea that you got to do this. Um, but that's not what the Bible shows us. The Bible shows us that it is Jesus who invites us. It's not whether you give your life to Christ, it's whether Christ has given his life for you. And to that, it's a resounding, yes, he has. Um, <clears throat> and it focuses, uh, here's a line from a sermon he reads, which is just wonderful. Uh, he didn't have time to prepare a sermon for uh, Sanctification Sunday, so he just stole one from another book. And good thing he did because he hears the gospel in it. And here's the line I'm going to want to read you It is a blessed thing from the faithful soul in prayer, fixes his uplifted eyes on faith, on Jesus only, when he does not look about him to lay hold on his own scattered thoughts, nor behind him at Satan who threatens him with the thoughts that his prayers is in vain, nor within him that his sloth and lack of devotion, but looks up to Jesus who sits at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. Um, Luther said, uh, these are the two subjects on which we preach. The law produces thirst and leads to the healer or leads the hearer to hell and kills him. The gospel, however, refreshes him and leads him to heaven. Um, yeah, another thing from uh, the small catechism that I'd like to share is uh, it's called a salvation outline, and uh, 
it's it says you should have these seven things memorized. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but they are seven core truths of the gospel and everyone should at least know them in their heart. So number one is God loves you. And the reference is John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Two, you are a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Three, God punishes sin. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Number four, Jesus took our punishment. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Number five, Jesus rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 says, For what I receive, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. 6. Jesus offers forgiveness of sins and eternal life to those who believe in him. Acts 16, 30-31 He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. 7. Salvation is free, a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8-9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Um, and that's the gospel. It's not about what you do. It's what Christ did. So if your theology at all goes back to yourself, then you're not, you're not living in the message of the gift of the gospel. It is a gift. What do you do to receive, to get a gift? You just receive it. You don't have to do something first. It's given to you. And likewise, in Lutheran theology, we see if you try to earn it yourself or um, you can't make it, but the only way to really not receive the gospel is to be pushing it away. And we have that temptation because how much more pleasing is it to our flesh if I can make it on my own? But how silly does it look to say, oh, I I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. Because really, that's like saying, well, I'm so good that God's got to let me into heaven like he owes me something for how good I am. And when you put it in those terms, it kind of sounds a little silly. Um, the other night, I had a youth meeting on Zoom, and I we taught on Luke chapter 15 which is all the parables of the lost things. And I really wanted to focus on who is Jesus telling this story to in the context of uh, Luke 15. And he's telling it to the Pharisees uh, because they see him eating with sinners and tax collectors, and they think themselves to be so righteous. And at the end of the first parable, the parable of the lost sheep, we are discussing uh, with my youth, does that make sense, leaving one or leaving your 99 sheep for the one? And, you know, they kind of went, no, in our worldly sense, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, you still got those 99. But then uh, my one youth said something is so profound. Um, I just loved it. He said, yeah, but if you go and get the one, then you have 100. And, you know, that's just such a beautiful picture of God's longing for us, God's seeking after us. I remember in my first year of CLBI reading through with the minor prophets um, and just seeing God's heart for how he wants to save everyone. It practically says that the only reason we haven't actually come to the end times yet is because God wants to save as many people as possible. Um, yeah, uh, and then going down that, uh, it, how often do we see in our culture people thinking that they are good based on their own works? When Jesus himself said, 
when asked a good teacher, um, he rebuked the man and said, no one but God is good. Um, and with the parable of the lost sheep, he's trying to point out, you know, heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents more than it does over 99 righteous people because 99 righteous people, they don't exist. And he, you see in the final story, the one of the, the prodigal son, as we commonly refer to it, but as I pointed out to my youth last night, it's more of the story of the prodigal father because the, of the starting statement, there was a man who had two sons. So the subject of the story is the man. But at the end we see, well, first with the first son, you know, he goes to the far off land after taking half the inheritance and squandering it. And it's so funny. He comes back with this opinion of, you know, I'll just say I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Make me a servant because my father's servants, they have all that they need. All their needs are taken care of. And he starts taking himself out of the identity that he has from birth as a son and trying to put the identity of a servant on himself. And the father's been watching out for him and he sees him at the property line. He goes running to his son. His son starts doing his rehearsed bit, you know, um, father, I have sinned against heaven and earth. And his father, it's like, he's not even listening. He just yells to the servants, get this son, the uh, robe that says he is part of my family. Get him a ring with the family signet. Get him shoes for his feet. And he just embraces him with a hug and kisses him. And as he's trying to make himself a servant to the father, the father says, no, 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 you're my son. And then he throws a celebration. Uh, there's a lot of celebrating in these parables. I once heard a pastor talking about, as Christians, we should really throw more parties. You know, we often see Jesus at parties and, you know, we should, if heaven has celebrations over someone who has been saved, why don't we, you know, that'd be an awesome party. Anyway, um, then, you know, we get to the other son, the one who was obedient, the one who stayed at home. And, you know, as I myself see myself as the prodigal son who wanders away um, I know lots of people who are in, who have seen themselves as the other son, the one who's under the law. And when the father comes out to invite him into the party, bring that invitation, the son says, I have worked for you all of my life. I've never done anything against your will. And yet uh, you have never given me a goat to celebrate with my friends. Yet this son of yours where he's disconnecting himself from the family at this point, saying, this son of yours, um, not even admitting that he is his son. And when he's doing this, when he's saying, I've done all this stuff for you, he's also taking on the identity of the servant. And that is both people who are under the law. They're trying to go from a spot where they start in the gospel as sons, um, as we do, and they try to put themselves into the law where it's what I do, what I can do to earn my way in. But then the father at the end, he says, my son, and he goes on. It does, it's not about the things that we do. Uh, it's what, who the father says we are and what he does for us in sending his son, Jesus Christ to die for us, that we may be sons of God. Um, as we are fellow heirs with Christ now because of what he has done for us, that we are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus is preparing a place for us in his father's house. And that's the gospel. It's not what you do. It's Jesus only. It takes all the pressure off, even though often our temptation is to take the pressure back onto ourselves because if I can just earn it, our sinful flesh tells us. And Satan's there whispering in our ears as he was to Adam and Eve, like, did God really say that you're his child? But yes, yes, he does. And that's the gift of the gospel. And uh, yeah, I think I've ran out of stuff to talk about. Back to you, Dean. Mackenzie, thank you for sharing. Um, Mackenzie, when I was starting off tonight, I asked a question, why well, I started with the parable of the soils. And uh, I said that the teaching tonight will help bring 
enrichment to the soil of your of your heart. So, Mackenzie, for you, question for you: um, How has the gospel been at work to move you from one of those soils to the good soil? Can you tell us a story? Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm, that's a good question. Which soil? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily the rocky soil. Maybe the one, uh, the seed that's in the soil filled with weeds and thistles. Um, so when I was uh, high school, I attended Resurrection when Pastor Dean was the pastor there. And, uh, you know, I ended up not going to a Bible camp one year. And one of my friends who attended that Bible camp was struggling with alcoholism and to cover up for his own addiction uh, that year that I wasn't there, he said that I had a problem with alcoholism. And boy, did Satan use that. So uh, when I came to church the following Sunday, not seeing this coming or having any knowledge of it, uh, a bunch of people who really had the, their heart in the right spot were coming up to me and asking if I had a problem because they genuinely wanted to help. But after hearing a number of people do that and you don't have that kind of a problem, it's really upsetting and it drove me away from church. Um, and then it's funny, it actually did lead me towards that path. I started living a really worldly life um, where I was just trying to have a good time according to the world's eyes, doing the things that uh, the world considers virtuous. Um, so I was now drinking and doing all of that stuff. But uh, towards the end of that, I put uh, my I went into a place of idolatry and I was getting choked out by the world. That's the thistles. And then we see the gospel come in with Jesus. Um, eventually, it all started falling apart when my relationship ended and I just wanted God back because I felt empty now. That spot where God had been, I replaced him with idolatry and I wanted him back now because I didn't want to feel this emptiness and I felt fulfillment from him. Uh, so I prayed, God, please just take this empty feeling away from me. And when I said, amen, it was like love just encapsulated me, surrounding and filling me. And it wasn't even three days later until Dean Rostad shows up at Superstore after about a year of me not going to church and invites me to do a Bible study with him. And, and that's just such the image I get of the lost sheep too. You know, the shepherd goes out and finds his sheep. In the time that I was ready, he was there. And as we see in the prodigal uh, son, it's the only story where the shepherd or the woman isn't going out and seeking the lost thing. Because in the other two, they wandered away, not on purpose. But in the prodigal son, he purposely leaves. And the father doesn't go pursuing him. But as soon as he's ready to come back, the father runs to him. And as soon as I was ready, I was in that place where I wanted to be back in my father's house, he sent out a shepherd to come and get me in the form of Dean Rostad. And ever since then, he's been pursuing me. And I guarantee he's doing the same in all of your lives. So I'd say that's how I was in the seeds of the world and letting them choke me out. And now I'm more of in the spot where I'm able to be a light to those thorns so that they may also become beautiful flowers as the father intended. Uh, thanks, Kenzie. Good fun. Here's a white fluffy sheep in my lap here. Anyway. Um, Kenzie, thank you. The gospel is powerful. And, and it's interesting that it's when we get into trouble, when we get into those snags, when we're surrounded by thorns, when we end up in the place where we don't want to be, it seems like it's at those moments when we're most ready to actually give up and to say, all right, I can't do this, God, I need you. And um, another type of conversion comes in. Yeah. Thank you for sharing tonight. Beautiful words. So as we've heard uh, these words, as we've heard scripture being spoken, well, what does God love to do when we hear the word being taught? He creates faith. And that has been doing a uh, turning over the soil of our hearts, getting it ready for God's seed. So um, 
thank you once again. So uh, as we go into our groups tonight, I encourage you to, to be reflecting on, you know, what's, what's standing out to you? How's God getting your attention? Uh, these, what we're doing in this virtual life on life discipleship is just trying to pay attention. God, how are you speaking to us? How are you getting my attention? What are you wanting to do deeper uh, within us? So thanks for coming tonight. Uh, God bless you as you go into your D groups now.